the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sins against God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship at Christ Lutheran Church on this second Sunday in Lent. Several announcements to share with you. We're just so delighted to have you with us this morning. And my first announcement would be to remind you uh, from the, in the weeks ahead uh, until things change dramatically, uh, please be sure to register either online or uh, by calling the church office in order to be with us on this Sunday morning so we can do the proper social distancing. Wednesday Reminder, Wednesday evening Lenten worship at 7 o'clock online. That's the Holden Evening Prayer, a beautiful, beautiful song service. Uh, and prior to that, at 6.30 on Wednesday evening, Pastor Tim continues his Bible study on the book of Acts. That is via Zoom. Family Bible study, reading the, family, reading the Bible together uh, under the direction of Deacon Diane is available Thursdays online. And then just a reminder to check your weekly emails uh, for details and events regarding all of our life here at Christ Church. Then I want to take just a moment uh, as, as we share communion in a, in a different manner, we are used to coming up and receiving it here at the altar rail. Now, of course, we do so with the individual cups. 
the little cups that look like chalices, okay? Now, there are, there are a couple different ways you can handle this. One would be to very carefully remove the bottom seal, and, and then the wafer will either drop out in your hand or you'll pick it out. The worst thing that can happen is you're going to miss, it's going to miss your hand, and it's going to drop on the floor, and as small as that is, you're going to have a lot of fun trying to find it. My suggestion would be, as you're holding the chalice with the wine up top, what it naturally looks like, simply turn it over. And then, as we do the taking of the bread, simply peel back, either all the way or just part way, and then tip it over so the, the little wafer will fall in your hand. So that way you can't lose it. And then just tip it back over again uh, as we share the grape juice. Uh, and again, just peel it back, probably all the way, uh, but halfway would be enough, just so enough so you can tip it to your mouth when we partake of the blood of Christ. Okay, so best bet for me would be to tip it up, receive the wafer that way, tip it back down, peel back, and you've got the, the grape juice. I guarantee you after one or two times, you're just naturally going to do it that way. God's richest blessings to all of you. And a word of greeting. Faith, so nice to have you with us here this morning as our rector, as our lector. We really appreciate it. We continue with God's word. The first lesson comes from the book of Genesis, the 17th chapter beginning at the first verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between you, me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer you sh shall you be named Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after, your through, after you throughout their generations. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your, to your offspring, offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall rise to nations. God, kings of peoples, shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
The second lesson is from the book of Romans, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only the, to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, he get, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believe, believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your dependents be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already, already, already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. And when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. For being fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised, had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for, this sake, for his sake, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who was raised Jesus our Lord, from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he then rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. This is our children's message time, and for the next couple of weeks, kiddos, I promise you're going to be invited to come forward again pretty soon, but not quite yet. So we're going to have to do the children's message from a bit of a distance, along with all the kids who are watching uh, today on live stream. So uh, I was thinking the other day how much things have changed, and I, I don't mean just the last year. We all know that. We're living through that right now. But I mean change since I was your age, guys, since I was your age. So we're talking about early 60s, all right? And so what things have changed? Well, we can just go down the list. I mean, everything from computers to internet, whatever, along the way, uh, you know, cell phones 
just the idea of cell phones and the games we can play on cell phones. When I grew up, it was nothing but board games. How many of you like board games? There are a few of you who still like board games, blast from the past, right? Uh, yeah, we had game night every night at my house. Friday night, we'd play Skittles. You might remember Skittles, some of you, you know, with the, like the, the, the wooden bowling pins that are set up and you pull the string on the thing that's whatever. <laughs> or Trouble, Monopoly, whatever. But I brought with me one of the most famous board games of all time. It's called The Game of Life. Anybody ever played The Game of Life? Oh, yeah. The Game of Life. My wife, Sharon, hates this game. But anyway, that's a whole other story. The Game of Life. Now, interestingly enough, did you know that this is the oldest board game that we have, besides chess and checkers and those kinds of things? But the, it was the first modern day board game. And you know the year that it was invented? 1860. 1860 was the first year of the game of life. And on the back, of course, you know, you play it, you know, you spin, and you, you know, you, whatever number, you, you move ahead, faces, whatever. But the back of the game says this, live the life you want. Choose your path for a life of action, adventure, and unexpected surprises. It's your choice. It's your choice. Now, anybody know how you win the game? Who wins the game? Anybody remember? Whoever has the most money at the end of the game wins. So you make choices, like choices what you want to do for your life, living career-wise, when you want to get married, how many children you want to have. Actually, this says you can even choose to have nine to ten children. I don't know if that's a new addition to the game. I don't remember that number, frankly, but yeah, yeah, it's your choice. Now, I'm just wondering, in this game of life, if Jesus had something to do with this game of life and we were to make choices, which he asks us to do, and we all have to make choices every day, what do you think he would have thought of the winning, the way to win this game? Would he have agreed with the idea of whoever has the most money wins? the game of life, or whoever, you know, the bumper sticker, whoever has the most toys wins. Do you think that would be how Jesus would put that together? No. And we know that from our gospel reading for today, right? Whoever wants to follow me must take up his cross, bear, bear his cross, and follow me. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, and what does it mean to bear our cross? We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But it means not just choosing what's best for ourselves all the time, boys and girls. It's also about thinking about other people and what's best for them. And sometimes putting ourselves maybe second or third and choosing what's best for somebody else instead of us. That's part of what it means to bear our cross. So this week, be thinking about how you can be a blessing in somebody else's life choosing to help them and serve them in Jesus' name. And now grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen Christ, Amen. The problem with having the preacher do the children's sermon is that you usually get the sermon during the children's message, so maybe I should just say amen and move on, but that's okay. We're not going to do that. Our gospel lesson for today, this second Sunday in Lent, continues our Lenten theme, and really it's the theme for every single Lent, journeying with Jesus to the cross. And, and what that focusing or following of Jesus asks of us, requires of us. And so today Jesus says to the multitude, to the crowds, to the disciples, to Peter, to you and to me, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
You know, for those early Christians who were reading the Gospel of Mark for the first time, they got the Gospel right in front of them, they knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. They knew exactly what he meant by that. Because many of them had been witness to the fact that he literally picked up his own cross. Literally picked up his own cross. Jesus willingly chose to go against his own will. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane, which we'll see during Holy Week. He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and what is he praying? He's praying, Father, I really don't want to go through tomorrow. Doesn't sound like a great day. So if there's another way we can do this, please let me know now. But then he said this, but not my will, not my will, but your will, Father, be done. And so sure enough, Jesus did what he had to do. He did what he had to do, not for himself, but for you. He did what he did for you and for me. And so now what does it mean to bear one's cross? Well, that has gotten, that definition has gotten a little fuzzy over the centuries, hasn't it? Just a little fuzzy as to what bearing one's cross means. It's kind of like the lady who said to a friend, I guess my bitterness is my cross to bear. I guess my bitterness is my cross to bear. And her friend replied, no, dear, I think that's your husband's cross to bear. Neither perspective has anything to do whatsoever with Christian cross bearing. Neither one. So what did Jesus mean when he said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross? Well, here's what Jesus meant. When you bear the cross or even wear the cross, bear the cross or wear the cross, you are saying, we are saying, because we're all in this together, right? We are saying that we are willing to serve God no matter what. We are willing to serve God no matter what. We are also saying that we are willing to serve others in Jesus' name, no matter what. Serve others in Jesus' name, no matter what. And that we are willing to put ourselves aside sometimes to focus our attention, actually all the time, to focus our attention on Jesus and his kingdom. That we are willing to do that. That, that what's, that's what it means to bear the cross and to wear the cross. And you know what? That might cost us money. That might cost us precious time. That might cost us life in our comfort zone. It might cost us as it cost the disciples, all except John, their earthly life. And those who have been persecuted and martyred for the faith down through the centuries. Jesus means that when when you wish to come after him, you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. God's will comes first, not yours and not mine. So with that said, let me ask you, is that where you are today? Is that where you are today in your journey to the cross? Does that describe your life? Does that describe my life? You know, I think of a lot of decisions that I've made in, in my life, and, and, and a good number of those decisions, I'm sorry to say, had to do with me. Had to do with me. I made a decision that was best for me, most comfortable for me, less inconvenient for me, more lucrative for me, And I have not thought as much about the folks around me who would be affected by that. I've I've done that more than once, more than twice. You know, there are many Christians who live primarily for themselves and the people they love. And those folks aren't evil. They're not bad. Some are in church every week or online or radio church every week. They are law-abiding. They are God-fearing. The only problem is that they truly don't know what Christian cross-bearing is all about. And the fact is, if there's no gospel, or if you don't believe in Jesus, then it's no big deal. If you don't believe in Jesus, if you don't believe the gospel or hold on to that in faith, then it's no big deal, right? 
But if we do believe in Jesus, if we do confess him as Lord and Savior, if we do wish to follow Jesus, well, then it's a bigger deal. It's a bigger deal. It's about striving to live the Jesus life in this world. And we might be asking ourselves, well, what does that look like exactly? What does a Jesus life look like in this world today? Apostle Paul gave us a perfect formula for that in Philippians chapter 2. The first eight verses I'd like to share with you. Listen closely to what Paul says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, do we have encouragement from being united with Christ? I certainly hope so. If any comfort from his love, do we receive comfort from Christ's love? I certainly hope so. If any common sharing in the Holy Spirit amongst ourselves, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Hmm. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. What if we applied that to our politics? That's a rhetorical question. Just asking. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The same mindset that Jesus had. Who, and he's going to describe that now, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now imagine Jesus on the cross. By the way, Wednesday night's invited, you're invited online, we're doing the the last seven words of Christ from the cross. The other night, we did his first words from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I'm thinking to myself, when I read that, if I had the power of God, if I was God in the flesh, I guarantee you those wouldn't have been the first words out of my mouth. (laughs) You guys would have been in trouble. I can imagine Jesus, I can't imagine Jesus, but if it had been me, you know, you guys, you just wait until I'm back in three days, then you're mine, right? He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. That, my friends, is true Christian cross-bearing. And you know that cross-bearing will take many, many forms, the, the many different ways that we can be blessings to other people in the name of Jesus. Mary Glover, one example. She's in charge of a Christian outreach ministry in Washington, D.C. that feeds the homeless every Saturday night. She used to be one of the homeless who would stand in line at that very ministry. But she got back on her feet again with the help of other folks, and so now she is the director of this ministry. And she prays with those folks who are volunteering every Saturday night before the folks come in for their food. And the prayer, her prayer goes like this, Lord, we know you'll be coming through this line tonight. So help us to treat you well. Help us to treat you well. That's cross-bearing. That's the Jesus life, right? Or how about this? John Maxwell, in his book, The Power of One, shares this story. In 2001, the CEO of Baxter International, a medical supply company, made a decision that cost his company $189 million. Now, I know what you're thinking. Another in the long list of CEOs that cooked the books or, or absconded with funds to pay for a luxurious lifestyle. That is not the case. That is not the case. 
Harry Kramer, the CEO, it was his honesty, his faith, his sense of ethics that caused him to make another kind of decision. You see, executives at Baxter International learned in 2001 that one of the products they manufactured, a filter for a kidney dialysis machine, may have been defective. Some dialysis patients using the Baxter International filter had died of unexplained causes. Rather than covering up the situation or passing it on as, as inaccurate, Kramer recalled all the filters, instituted a rigorous investigation into the problem, and this recall and investigation cost the company $189 million. In addition, he said, the performance bonus that I get every year, we're cutting out altogether because this happened on my watch. And then to top it all off, he informed all of his competitors in the manufacturing business of the flaws in his filters so that they could benefit from the research his investigation turned up. That's cross-bearing, right? That's cross-bearing. That's the Jesus life. And again, it happens in many different ways. Now, let me say this, and please hear this. If you have fallen asleep, wake up because this is important. Are you all awake? I need to see your hands up just for proof before I go on. Okay. Chet, put your hand up. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus was not. Jesus is not. I am not talking about works righteousness or earning our salvation. That's not what this is about. The moment you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and believed on the forgiveness of your sins through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the tomb, you were saved. You were justified by his grace through faith. That's what our second lesson talks about in Romans, right? Using Abraham as the example. You are justified by his grace through your faith. But friends, wouldn't it be an awesome thing to someday stand before the Lord and have him, Jesus himself, the word of God made flesh, the creator of all time and space, to look you in the eye and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Gives me goosebumps just to think of that. So my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, how will you and I be blessings to others this week in the name of Jesus? How are we going to be cross bearers, Jesus lifers? Be on the lookout for the opportunities the Lord will bring your way because he will. He will. Amen.
we confess our holy Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Almighty God, your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized, that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give all believers joy in your promises and give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God. Creator God, all the ends of the earth worship you. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God. Sovereign God, you rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within all peoples and nations. Hear us, O God. Emmanuel, God, in Jesus you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving and bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Hear us, O God. Father God, you made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless all grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Equip all ministries and services dedicated to family care. Hear us, O God. Compassionate God, we continue to pray for all who suffer with the COVID virus and the millions of people in Texas still in need of food, water, and electricity. And we give thanks for the freedom finally granted to Miriam Vargas and her family. Hear us, O oh God. We await the day of Christ's coming. Almighty God, again in glory, he will come. Lead us by the example of all the saints who have taken up their cross and followed you, that together we too may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
and then we pray together as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we receive the body and blood of our Lord. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And now, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. much, Faith. Beautifully done. Thank you. Check. Yeah. 